We have uh, Dr. Hyun Kim with us today. Uh, he's an assistant professor and chief of the GI service and lead physician um, MR clinical service at the Department of Radiation Oncology and the Washington University School of Medicine at the Seidman Cancer Center. Um, we're really excited to have him here with us to tell us about non-operative management of rectal cancer. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Thanks for having me. So here are some of my disclosures. Um, so many of you know that colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer in men and second most in women. It's the fourth leading cause of cancer-related deaths. And here's kind of the fancy staging system that many people um, use. And the reason that I show you this is because I really want to focus here. Um, we stage the tumor by how much of the um, rectal wall it invades. And the reason that this is important is I, I want to um, help you guys understand that when we're talking about rectal cancer, generally most people will need to have an oncologic surgery. And what does that mean? That means you have to cut out a good portion of the bowel. The ones that can have some sort of local excision where you just snip out the tumor are these people. Um, we call them a transanal local excision. And it's when you have less than 30% of the um, circumference of the bowel involved, less than three centimeters in size. The margin has to be clear. So more than three millimeter margin it has to be movable like it's not fixed to the wall within eight centimeters of the anal verge and only T1. Remember that was the staging. Um, and then none of these other adverse features. And so everybody else, um, you know, if you have um, T, um, everyone else gets the oncologic surgery and usually the oncologic surgery is a total mesorectal excision and I'll explain that later. And then for these T1 to T2, which are just T2, just invading the, mus um, the muscle of the rectum, um, you can observe them, but everybody else needs some sort of adjuvant therapy. And um, we know that if you give the therapy after the surgery, it's um, less well tolerated. So the standard therapeutic approach is, you know, curative surgery, the local failure is less than 10% with T1 and T2. If you do surgery alone for these other things, the local failure goes higher. And it could be very debilitating with limited ability to salvage or to, um, you know, to treat the tumor if it comes back. And so preoperative chemo radiation therapy has kind of um, become more and more popular in NSABP R03. They showed that it improved disease-free survival. And then the German rectal trial, it showed that it improved uh, the local control um, from, you know, the failure rate was seven versus 10% at 12 years. And you know, these patients require an um, abdominal perineal resection or a low anterior resection. The APR can require, or it requires a bag for the rest of the life, a stoma. And when you're giving the chemotherapy after the surgery, so let's say you didn't give the preoperative chemo radiation, then there's only a 50% compliance. Whereas if you give it before, it could be um, as high as 80%. So this is the TME that I was talking about. You excise, along the rectum here. And it's this um, fatty bag of adipose tissue and the rectum and the lymph nodes. And the surgeons do this with sharp dissection and they try to cut out the tumor um, with margin above and below. And we have this late experience um, from a Dutch study that I'll talk more about later. Um, sometimes people think, oh no, if you could do surgery alone and connect the patient back together again, their bowel function will be as good as the day they were born or something like that. But we know that's not the case. And our, our surgical colleagues feel that um, we'll be the first to recognize that as well. From the Dutch experience, we saw that 36% of patients that just had the TME reported major LAR um, syndrome. Um, if you add radiation on top of that, you get another 20%, so 56% of these patients. So these patients have a lot of side effects if you undergo this therapy. Here are the side effects that they complain most about, incontinence at day, at night, anal mu mucus loss, anal bone loss, and the use of pads. So there have been studies um, done with NCDB um, kind of looking at the, the treatment trends in the country. And we found that more and more people are trying to do local excision alone. So um, here we saw that about 2,100 patients treated with local excision and 1,300 patients treated with surgical resection and patients who got the radiation and chemotherapy were excluded. And you can see that it's creeping up over the years. That's really what this graph is here to show. Um, 
And they found that, you know, the five-year local recurrence after local excision versus surgery, if it was 13 versus 7% for T1 tumors, and then 22 versus 15% for T2 tumors. And then the five-year overall survival seemed about the same for the T1. Um, maybe it was different for the T2. And so what does this study really show? It shows that for some reason, people in the country, even though you tell them, look, the standard of care is you need to get an oncologic surgery, an APR or LAR, they're still saying, no, I want sub-therapeutic okay, care. Um, and who knows why? Maybe there's medical reasons they couldn't get it. Um, but I'd want this, the smaller surgery, um, and I'm willing to accept those risks. And so one of the studies of interest that came out of Memorial Sloan Caring is the timing study. And what they did is they took a bunch of patients and they randomized these patients to get either two, four, or six months of chemotherapy um, after chemo radiation. So you have these patients, you give them chemo radiation over five and a half weeks, and then you give them different amounts of chemo. And they wanted to see what happens. And there was 80% chemotherapy compliance. And this is kind of the money slide here. And so this group one, they just got the chemo RT, and then they got surgery after four weeks. Group two got two cycles, which is one month of chemotherapy, and then two months of chemotherapy and three months of chemotherapy. And what they found, and this rarely works so well in science and medicine, is that every time you increase the amount of chemotherapy that the group got, the pathologic complete response, meaning that when the surgeons went in and cut out the tumor, the tumor was all gone, up to 38% of the time. And so it seems like if you give the chemotherapy after chemo radiation, but before surgery, it's better for the patient's um, um, outcomes. So non-operative management is um, increasingly in vogue, partially because of these experiences I'm about to um, review, but also because of COVID. And you know, probably the oldest experience is by Dr. Halver Gama from Brazil. And what she did is she's been treating these patients within, um, with tumors within seven centimeters from the anal verge. And she gives the neoadjuvant chemo radiation. So five and a half weeks of radiation. And then they look at them at eight weeks. And she found a clinical complete response of 49%, which is pretty good. So about half the tumors go away completely. And this is kind of what their workflow was. Okay, so we're not going to go into the details of this slide. How they follow them up is every you know, two to three months, they're doing digital rectal exams for the first two years and endoscopy. Um, and then they will get a CT every six months or 12 months. And what they found was the five-year local recurrence-free survival was about 69%. So that's pretty good. Um, there are our discussion whether they were just picking the best patients or whether this is truly the real world experience. Um, one important thing to note is that maybe five to 10% of patients developed metastatic disease after two and four years. And so why is that? Is it because they would already have the metastatic disease they were going to get it anyway? Um, or was it because we didn't cut it out and that led to the metastasis? Because there's always a risk if you're not cutting it out completely that the cancer will spread. Denmark has also been doing this kind of non-operative management and they had low rectal adenocarcinoma tumors and they treated with chemo radiation, but they also used the brachytherapy boost. Brachytherapy is when you use radioisotopes um, and kind of place them on the tumor area or through the tumor to kind of shrink it. And they were looking at clinical complete response. And if there was a negative biopsy and no lymph nodes on imaging, they went under non-operative management. And these are the patients that they were looking at. I'll just keep that slide there for future reference. They found that 78% of their patients treated like this had a clinical complete response, which is great. And you know, the, these are the tumors. And when you're looking, when our surgeons go back to look, you want to make sure that there's, you know, a kind of a white scar, maybe telangiectasias, but otherwise no tumor there. And radiographically, you're looking for no T2 bright signal. These are the common side effects that you see with the chemo radiation. Um, some, you know, the chemotherapy is causing nausea and vomiting, the radiation contributes to the diarrhea, um, and maybe some bladder toxicity as well. They had a very similar follow-up schedule. And then their local recurrence was um, about 20, 23% at a medium follow-up of um, 10 months. And so really we're kind of looking at if these people get the chemo radiation similar to the 
um, prior experience, um, about 80% of them have um, clinical complete response that seems to last for a while. The Netherlands has also done this. They had 100 patients, same thing, chemo-RT with capecitabine. Some patients had um, short course radiation and they were looking at clinical complete response as well. And very similar, they needed to get a digital rectal exam, endoscopy and MRI that showed no evidence of disease. So uh, no, TT, um, no T2 bright signal, they had to have no residual tumor and had a white scar and no palpable tumor. This is kind of their schema of patients as well. This is not so important. Their um, follow-up schema was, you know, being evaluated every three months. And their three-year local recurrence pre-survival was 85%. So what do we learn from these experiences? Um, here are some of the, um, the symptoms that they had. The three-year colostomy free survival was 95%, which is great. So 95% of their patients didn't need a, um, didn't need a bag, which is fantastic. And so the, the moral of the story from this is basically these long course chemo RT experiences really set the stage for non-operative management. They showed that it could be done safely and with good follow-up. Usually we see most of the recurrences by two years and the patients seem to have good bowel function as well. Um, so in 2018 was the first time NCCM put in their guidelines that people with a complete clinical response, you can undergo a watch and wait non-operative management paradigm after careful discussion with the patient and the tumor board. And so Washington University, that's when we started our um, non-operative management as a standard of care for all patients undergoing short course radiation and chemotherapy. So how did we get to that point? So short course radiation has been used for a long time in Europe and also for decades at WashU. The oldest um, kind of big trial that was reported in 2011, the Dutch rectal experience um, showed that 25 gray followed by TME versus TME alone. When you're looking at local recurrence, the radiation helps with the local control. So the local recurrence, if you had the radiation on board is 5% at 10 years versus 11% if you're just doing surgery and the 10 year old survival was about the same. Some people think that maybe there was a survival advantage if you had a negative circumferential resection margin or radial margin, but that was a post hoc analysis. So for short versus um, long course radiation, the Polish two study was a phase three randomized study and they were looking at five times five, which is the short course, uh, followed by full FOX times three cycles versus chemo radiation with 50 gray and full FOX. Oxaliplatin was later dropped because there was multiple studies showing that it's not helpful. And they were looking at um, R0 resection and pathologic complete response. So what does this show us? The Polish DO study basically said, look, if you give short course and then chemotherapy versus chemo radiation, it's the same. You're going to have the same R0 resection rate, which means there's not gonna be positive margins. So the surgeons are able to get all the tumor out. And then the pathologic complete response rate seems to be about the same. So maybe we should be doing short course. And in Europe where resources are um, you know, scrutinized and people are traveling from far away, this seems like a very good option. With fo further follow-up, they saw that there was no difference in overall survival and disease-free survival was same as well. So at WashU, um, Dr. Meyerson and his group reported this in 2014. They had treated patients with five times five followed by full flux. And they treated um, 20 gray to the pelvis and 25 gray to the mesorectum. And their cl clinical complete response rate was 28% and pathologic complete response rate was 42%. And if you kind of overlay this on the general and rectal trial, which you're not supposed to do, you're not supposed to mix studies, it seemed like their local control was very, very good compared to um, this large study from Germany. The Rapido study, so many of you may have heard about this um, in the news recently. This was published um, in Lancet Oncology, I believe. And what they showed was um, they were evaluating these T4N2 patients or enlarged lateral lymph nodes. And they gave them short course followed by KPOX or um, full FOX. And they compared it to long course chemo radiation therapy. And they accrued in 920 patients. And WashU was the only US institution, I believe, who accrued on this trial. Everybody else was from outside, um, from Europe and outside the United States. And so the pathologic complete response rate, short course one, 28% versus 
Um, the cumulative probability of disease-related treatment failure, 24 versus um, 30 percent. And so there was more failure in the long course arm. Distant metastases, more in the long course arm. Local regional failure, not statistically significant. And then everything else was not statistically significant. And that's a good thing. That's showing that overall health, quality of life, LAR syndrome, all of those were the same between short course and long course. And so what does that mean? That means short course is the winner. And WashU is kind of vindicated, right? Because uh, we were, Dr. Myerson and his group and um, his predecessors, a lot of credit has to be given to them because they were doing this for a long time where um, a lot of the United States didn't think that this was the right way to go. And so what did that lead to? So this is kind of, this is kind of the WashU way and these are um, the data that are supporting it. And this is kind of specifically what you guys asked me to talk about. And so the normal R study, so non-operative um, management of the rect um, um, with, let's see, I'll remember this later. Um, sorry, so non-operative radiation treatment um, of the adenocarcinoma of the lower rectum, so the normal R study, um, was basically treating 25 gray with a possible optional um, boost um, to the primary. And then they had full FOX times eight cycles. And um, we were looking at clinical complete response. And then if you have persistent disease, you would get chemotherapy or um, TME. The primary endpoint was clinical complete response. And then we were looking at the patient report of outcomes um, for um, anal rectal function and grade three toxicity. So the target accrual, it was small, it was 20 patients. And we were looking for clinically detectable tumors that were less than 20, 12 centimeters from the anal verge. And this was what their treatment was. And we don't start chemotherapy um, before two weeks after radiation ends. These are the nitty gritty on the chemo details. Um, we would assess them like, much like other people two to four weeks after the chemotherapy was completed with the MRI, digital rectal exam, and endoscopy and then follow them every three months if they had a non um, underwent non-operative paradigm. Um, persistent or progressive disease got further chemotherapy, hopefully to get them here, or a TME. So we assessed for 26 patients, eventually treated 20. Um, 19 only got the assigned therapy because one patient had a full FOX allergy. 14, 14 of the patients had a clinical re response, complete response. Um, one patient got more chemotherapy and then underwent non-operative management, so 15 patients total, and then five with local regrowth, and nine continued on non-operative management. And so at a median follow-up of 28 months, the initial clinical complete response was 74%. So this was fantastic when we first um, found these data, right? 74% um, of patients had short-course radiation and then chemotherapy and then didn't need our surgery, which is fantastic. And then the one-year clinical complete response was 68%. And so 68% of these patients continue to have no tumor, no lymph nodes um, at one year. We published these results in clinical colorectal cancer research this year. Um, you can see here that um, the probability without events, this is, let's see, all patients, so tumor regrowth-free survival versus TME-free survival. Um, this here is how many patients underwent um, that were undergoing initial non-operative management, tumor regrowth, free survival, and TME free survival. So they're kind of overlapping. Um, this here is the regional control and the distant metastasis free survival. And then this here is the overall survival versus disease free survival. So this is just kind of descriptive statistics. Here we see that the regional control if you had a clinical complete response initially versus a partial response, your regional control was much, much better, as was your distant metastasis free survival and even your overall survival and disease free survival. So, what do these graphs show you? It basically means if you had the initial clinical complete response, your tumor went away um, with the therapy as intended, then you were going to do a lot better. So, that means that your tumor responded to the therapy better or something else was going on um, because, and because of that, your the disease didn't come back for a much later time. So from the not non the normal R study, um, we realized that non-operative management of rectal endocarcinoma short course and chemotherapy is feasible, but we needed future studies to require um, 
or sorry, feature studies were required to validate the long-term safety and durable efficacy. Because the follow-up was short. It was only a little bit more than two, two years, right? And so we have the retrospective data. Remember I shared that starting in January of 2018, we started doing this as standard of care where all our patients underwent short course radiation followed by four months of chemotherapy. And if they had a clinical complete response, they would undergo um, non-operative management. And so we have a cohort of 90 patients that fit this paradigm. They got 25 and five to the pelvis with an optional primary boost and they were delivered with either conventional 3D radiation or IMRT, um, and then involved extra mesorectal rectal lip, pelvic lymph nodes. So these are the lymph nodes that are in the pelvis, but would not be removed by that TME that we were talking about. So they wouldn't be cut out. So we wanted to treat those with an extra high dose. When our patients are getting radiation, this is the nice little four field box that we talked about that they're getting. It covers kind of the mesorectum. This green is the target that we generate based on our clinical target volume. These are the dose constraints for the um, more savvy people out there, but um, generally we just limit how much the small bowel gets and everything else is kind of free flying and we haven't seen much toxicity. Um, the chemotherapy and the treatment is very similar to the normal R study. And then the follow-up, we wanna make sure that there's no palpable mass, there's a flat white scar and no T2 signal. Um, we followed them every three months. Patients without a CCR, there was surgical resection, and we graded by CTCA version five. Here are our patients. And I just want to point out here that, you know, the locally advanced tumors were 96%. In normal R, we had 79%, and that may explain some of our outcomes later. In this study, the stage three patients were 76%, whereas normal R was 47%. And so, um, let's see. Here are some of the data just showing kind of, you know, um, most of our patients started radiation within 1.4 months of being diagnosed. Most of our patients started chemotherapy within two to three weeks of completing radiation. This is kind of the important slide here. We wanna share that overall 51% had a clinical complete response rate. And so some people are wondering, well, why is that different from normal R, the phase one study? Part of it is because normal R was very small, right? It's only 19 patients. So the numbers fluctuate very widely. With 90 patients, we're better able to understand kind of what's going on. And also there's a lot more uh, advanced stage disease in this patient population. Patients with locally advanced disease, remember, um, were 49% of this. So, and then other results, these are not so important, but basically these are kind of describing um, how much had pathologic complete response that underwent surgery. Um, sometimes, so what does that mean? You know, sometimes there are patients that we think have to go to surgery for one reason or another. And then when we go and cut them out, cut out, cut out the tumor, the tumor is all gone. And so that's just something to keep in mind as well, that sometimes it looks like the tumor is still there, but it, it's not there. And then other times where we think that it's gone, but it's just under detection of the MRI. Um, let's see. So at a median follow-up of 16 months, this was presented at Astro. Um, 79% patients had a continued clinical complete response rate. Um, everybody that had a local failure were salvaged with either chemotherapy or surgery and all had no evidence of disease at last follow-up. Zero patients had late grade three, four toxicities. Um, and then among patients with a continued clinical complete response, um, about half of them had no late GI toxicities. And this is actually very important. You know, there's the anecdotal data where I have my patients come back and they're like, wow, my bowel function is baseline of what it was before surgery. And we love that. I love to hear that. And so this, this is important that the data actually support that now. Um, very rarely do we have patients who are saying, um, you know, my bowel function is really not as good as it was before. It's better than when I had the tumor, but I'm still rushing to the bathroom. And that, that is not fulfilling for me. But it, thankfully, we're not having patients that are having these late, you know, have to be hospitalized or have to be um, emergently 
taken to the OR because of side effects. So the conclusions from this retrospective data, our early data show that short course followed by chemotherapy and the non-operative management of rectal endocarcinoma can result in a clinical complete response and organ preservation in locally advanced tumors. Um, it leads to acceptable GI toxicity and we need further follow-up because as you know, retrospective data can be biased. We could have been cherry picking our best patients. We, didn't, we don't think that we did, but that's always a possibility with these experiences. So caveats to non-operative management, a clinical complete response like I talked about before does not necessarily mean pathologic complete response. So we know from Memorial's data that 25% of clinical complete responders um, have pathologic complete response. So there, and it may have been that they were cutting or going to the OR too early, but their experience shows that 75% of the patients that we think the tumor is completely gone may still be there. Now, their experience is um, heavily dependent on um, long course chemo radiation, and they frequently treat with chemotherapy first and then chemo radiation. So maybe that's where the differences are. Um, and then also remember that the, the primary tumor, the rectal tumor going away completely, the pathologic complete response of the tumor may not equal the lymph nodes going away completely. So we know that the, um, when the tumor goes away completely, there's still 7% chance that the lymph nodes are there. So um, we need to be careful. And we still don't know about the, you know, the obturator lymph nodes, the ones that don't come out with the surgery. So non-operative management of rectal cancer is an increasingly utilized treatment paradigm. Early data indicate that short course of non-operative management seem feasible with similar oncologic outcomes as trimodality therapy. I just want to touch briefly on the NOM-ERA study. So this is non-operative management, early risk um, assessment, and also a play of words. I really do believe we are entering into this non-operative management era, correct? And so, and also normal R was to be a play on words of, we really want to maintain a normal rectum. And that's kind of the goal for patients and it's the goal for providers. And so NOM-ERA is a multi-institution study, and we're proud to say that University of Colorado, University of Vermont, and Mayo Rochester are all part of this study with Washington University. We're treating 25 grain, five fractions to the pelvis with an optional boost to the primary, and then the lymph nodes get an extra boost. We're following this with consolidative chemo, full pox for four months versus K-pox for five cycles, which is approximately four months and then non-operative management for clinical complete response. We want to determine if short course followed by multi-drug chemotherapy results in a clinical complete response rate greater than 50% in a multi-institution setting. These are our secondary objectives. We're looking at progression-free survival, patient-recorded outcomes, incidence of post-chemotherapy, um, grade three um, toxicity, facts, um, assessment of anal rectal function, and then these exploratory objectives got cut off the slide, but we're also looking at um, fac focal adhesion kinase expression, so the tumor microenvironment, as well as circulatory tumor DNA. And so Signatera or Natera, um, Natera has um, graciously agreed to fund, or not fund, but to provide the circulating tumor DNA kits for this study so that we can assess if um, CT DNA can help us detect um, molecular residual disease. And so I'm very, very excited about the study. Um, we're looking at 68 patients accru um, accrued across all um, sites, um, a goal accrual of 20 per year over three years. So far, WashU has been open for about six months and we've accrued 10 already. And so we're well on our way. Um, and assuming a 10% dropout, we're looking at 62 patients in the final analysis. Um, and so in regard to the study, if you guys know patients who would be interested in the study, please send them our way. Um, we've tried to cover the um, WEC, West Coast, Mid, um, Midwest, as well as the um, New England area with our um, geographic distribution, but also because the, um, those investigators, uh, Dr. Hellemeyer, Dr. Olson, and Dr. Aker are also proponents of short course radiation as, and non-operative management. So, with that, I'm happy to take any questions or um, answer any um, comments. Yeah, thank you so much. This was very informative. I, like, I, I was happy to see the Signatera and the CTDNA tests that you're using because I was kind of wondering that, you know, to know whether there is lymph node involvement or the chances of the cancer coming back. I mean, in our groups, um, we, uh, there are a lot of people. We have about 100 people who have already used Signatera for surveillance. 
And this is a, an area that people are really, really interested in. And then now, you know, with the garden reveal. So previously what was happening was that people didn't have enough tissue to do Signatera. Um, but, you know, as part of trials, obviously you can plan accordingly and you can collect enough tissue before, right? Um, so um, my question was about, I've heard that with short course, um, the main argument that I've heard about non-operative management is that people didn't know about fibrosis occurring in the rectum following radiation. And I mean, your results show that there is hardly any difference uh, and that, you know, bowel function is almost normal, right? Do you want to comment about it? Um, yeah. yeah, I think that, I, you know, I think that the studies still are early, right? And so I'm a big proponent of this and my patients tell me that they feel great. And because there are so many patients telling me that their bowel function feels normal, I, I may be biased a little bit, but the retrospective data of 90 patients indicate that, you know, um, there is very, very limited um, late toxicity. There's certainly no grade three, four, and about half of the patients report that they have no late toxicity as well. And I think that's fantastic. I think it compares very favorably with the long course experiences. And then also, you know, our colorectal surgeons have published a paper where they show that perioperative mortality after short course radiation and chemotherapy is the same as long course chemo radiation as well. And then the long-term follow-up for the Polish 2 study and the Polish 1 study show that the, you know, the side effects look very similar as well from long course and short course. Um, obviously, the Polish studies included surgery, right? Um, so that's, that's important to consider. But it seems like the fibrosis um, is very similar between the short course and the long course. And I think part of that also that we have to remember is the biologic effective dose with short course radiation is less than the biologic effective dose with long course chemo radiation. So we are giving a, sh a smaller amount of radiation dose um, over a shorter period of time, which is why the concern for fibrosis from um, the outside world. Um, but maybe maybe it's gonna eventually show that it's less side effects, who knows? I think that may be a question that we need to start throwing back at the proponents of long course chemo radiation. When we're giving a shorter or a smaller BED, maybe we're having less side effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, in our groups, people are concerned because they are thinking that what you get in uh, you know, 28 days, suddenly they are going to shrink and or combine and give in five days, but that's not exactly how it is, right? So they think that it's going to fry the tissue, but that's really not how it is, right? Correct, yeah. Um, like I said, it is a smaller biologic effective dose than the five and a half weeks. And so maybe that's why the side effects are so favorable. Yeah, my other question was about the boost that you give for the lymph nodes. Um, I, is that a common practice or are you doing it just because you're doing a CRT and so you wanted to take care of the lymph nodes? So the boosts for the lymph nodes are only for lymph nodes that we think are radiographically suspicious. So clinically suspicious lymph nodes that will not be taken out with the total mesorectal excision. And so because we're giving the radiation and it's hard to go back they're not gonna be removed surgically. And I understand at other institutions, there are some people who will remove these lymph nodes or involve their um, GU surgeons to do a lateral lymph node dissection. There have been papers published on this, but because at WashU, we don't do that. We just boost it with radiation. And we have been doing that as standard of care practice since for about the same amount of time and have not um, seen any increased toxicity. And we're looking at writing up that experience right now. One of our residents, Kamran Hasanada, as well as um, um, Greg, and I forget his last name, from colorectal surgery, one of the trainees over there, are looking at that, and we're presenting some of our um, result, results in Europe this year. Okay, okay. Um, the other thing that is of concern to people that I've seen in Rattleberg is that uh, the financial toxicity, you know, like, for example, with rectal cancer, you have the trimodality of treatment, right? You have, if you are doing 28 days of radiation, then you have to wait, then you get chemo, then you have to wait, and then you have surgery, and then you have to recover. So that's a long time for patients to be off work, especially young patients who are coming down with rectal cancer. So that's another place where I've seen that, you know, people are interested in short course because it's only five days, right? If you're considering the time that you take off work, that's much shorter if you follow short course. So, I mean, I just want to say that I'm really happy that, you know, you have this results. I mean, I had only heard about um, UT Southwestern, Dr. Nina Sanford. She had 
told us that you know she they've been using short course for some time, but I did not know that uh, you know there were other centers. So um, do you know of other places like if you wanted to make a list of people doing short course who are or who have had some experience doing short course? Um, do you know of other places? Yeah, so I know that there are, you know, so for our collaborators, for example, um, who are part of this trial. So University of Vermont, University of Colorado, and Mayo Rochester will all be using short course on this trial. So I think it's a fantastic opportunity to enroll patients on this trial. Um, as far as other centers, I know that um, during COVID, a lot of patients, um, a lot of centers have started using short course and may be more comfortable using that as well. Um, Memorial Sloan Kettering published a paper how they um, adopted short course during the pandemic, and um, you know the 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 GI ASCO, sorry, the GI um, there was a GI group that published in the Green Journal, I believe, um, who and I I think this was for Estro, I I don't want to misspeak, but um, I know they recommended hypofractionation during the COVID pandemic for rectal cancer as well when possible. And so I think that there are gonna be a lot more centers that will be using this. And I, I would ask, especially during the pandemic, um, especially now that the Rapido study has been published, um, ask your doctors, what, are, you, are you using short course? Why not use short course? Um, and then have, have a very intelligent conversation with them. I think until patients um, are advocates for themselves and know these data and say, can you please explain to me why you're not using short course? Um, that the physicians won't check themselves. Um, I think that's a very important part of this movement. Now, having said all this, short course in the setting of non-operative management, I'll be the first person to recognize that it should be done at high volume centers. Um, for the, our very first um, initial years, we did this on a prospective registry because it was technically a clinical trial question. And so I don't want to say that this should be the standard of care everywhere. That's why we're doing this multi-institution mom era study. And so I think patients should also recognize that if you're doing short course and you're doing chemotherapy, asking your doctor to all of a sudden do non-operative management would not be the standard of care or even a standard of care. It would be, um, it, is, it is the standard of care at WashU, um, but I don't think that you can impose that on every treating physician because there are different comfort levels, there are different ways of practice, and the data are still very new. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I'm also a patient advocate at the NCI Rectal Anal Task Force. So, you know, we had like a retreat recently and looking at what are, the, how are the trials geared for the, you know, next few years. So this is a, a topic of discussion about, you know, short course course versus long course and what what everyone wants right um, and I was thinking the, the point that you made is very very important because um, it's important for people to realize that even if they get short course um, their center may not be comfortable for a, opting for non-operative management right and then I've also heard this criticism that MSKCC had such great results because they had years of experience following patients who were on non-operative management and um, you know other centers may not get similar results depending on how much their experience is, right, and expertise in following these patients. And the other argument that I've heard is that um, if you're doing non-operative management, that, that means that every three months you have to go in for a battery of tests and that, you know, whether patients realize that what that involves, right, like versus when you have surgery and you're done, this in, in this other case, you know, at least for the first three years, for sure, you want to have more intensive surveillance, right? Do you want to comment about um, patient experiences at your center um, yeah. or surveillance? I think the patients that are here that have their rectum and were able to not undergo the surgery have been very, very happy. And here, I'll stop sharing my screen so we can see each other better, but um, have been very, very happy. And it really is the individual who makes that decision, right? As patient advocates, you know this. There are some patients who say, look, I'm dealing with a lot at home. I can't come in for these tests, cut this thing out, and I'll see you every six months or every year or something like that, right? And power be to them. We have to live our lives. I, I get that. There are other patients who I think are the majority of my patients that say, I'm so glad that my bowel function is as good as it is. I'm happy to come in every three months. After two years, we space the visits out to four to six months. And then after two years, the chance of recurrence has also decreased as well. And then once they get past that two year mark, they're happy that their tumor hasn't recurred and they're happy that they can space out the visits more. It's a win-win situation, but you're right. It, it's getting to that point. 
And so I think it's up to each individual to see which direction they want to go. Um, as far as your other point and um, MSKCC having so much experience, you're right, they're a great cancer center. We have to recognize that. And WashU has been doing this for quite a while as well. Um, and so I think as patients talk with their physicians, understand that certain things need to be evaluated, especially um, at specific centers if the data is not there on clinical trial. And so my message, I guess, to providers would be, if you're not comfortable that this is a standard of care, or if you're not comfortable that there's no more data to support this, make a trial, make a prospective registry, um, get something that's IRB approved, that's considered ethical at your institution, and then you can you can gain that experience and um, improve, um, report your outcomes, improve this field for everybody. Yes, yes, thank you so much. And um, yeah, the other patient concern is that, you know, when, when it recurs, um, I, I'm heard, I've heard patients come back and say that my doctor was really against not having surgery because they, they said that, um, you know, if I have a local recurrence, that means that I will also have like a distant recurrence that, you know, now I'll suddenly be stage four. Um, what has been your experience with patients that you have watched and who have had recurrence and salvage surgery and all of that? Yeah, that's a fantastic point. Um, I think that it's, it's something that we have to always keep in mind, right? And anytime you're not doing a surgery, um, whether it's lung cancer, prostate cancer, rectal cancer, breast cancer, well, anyway, so for lung, prostate, and rectum, um, anytime you're not doing the surgery, you need to realize that that's a possibility, right? And so in, in the non-operative experiences from those three countries that we mentioned, the Netherlands, Denmark, and Brazil, I think that the general kind of observ excuse me, observations that they had were most of the time you can salvage the patient with the surgery that they should have had. So when the tumor comes back, you can cut it out. And the reason they cut it out is because they didn't have distant metastases. And so I would say um, from those three experiences, uh, about 10, five to 10% of the time, yes, the tumor came back and either they couldn't cut it out because it involved something down in the pelvis or because the patient metastasized. Um, in the U.S., um, some of the data coming out from, um, from Europe and the U.S. indicate that maybe the non-salvageable recurrence may be as high as 10 to 20 percent, um, and those are from large, um, you know, collection of data, the Wash and Wade Consortium, et cetera. Um, so I think it's a risk. I think it's something that patients need to consider, um, but it's also an exchange of something, right? And so if a patient has a very, very low rectal tumor and all of a sudden you've given them a life without an ostomy, maybe they're willing to take that 10% chance that it may come back, they may not be able to cut it out. So that's a very um, patient and physician discussion and patient decision ultimately. Okay, okay. Um, the other question is like, so we have had a few patients who have, who have had low anterior um, resection and then they had like such severe LARS that you know, their quality of life is so bad that they opted for an ostomy later because they were like, you know, life is better with an ostomy because with Lars, it's not livable. So um, I'm, I'm sure that like your, you know, patient number is so low that, you know, you would not maybe have had numbers to see if anybody would come back. But from what you're saying, I, I don't think that that has been anyone's experience so far, right? Do you want to comment? Uh, are you saying people who have such horrible bowel function after the non-operative management? Yes. yes. Um, I have not had a patient like that yet. Okay. So, okay. And so we've treated probably 120, 130 patients, maybe more. We have to look at our update our database again, but yeah, we haven't had that experience yet. Okay. Okay. I think that's all the questions I have, and we will see if uh, any of the other uh, people in the um, call have any questions. Hi, I would just like to say thank you very much, Manju, because you asked the questions that I was going to ask, so that's great. Um, I'm particularly glad that people are starting to look more at, at the uh, CTDNA tests because I, I, I'm always worried a little tiny bit about being properly surveilled, um, but th this has been very, very helpful. Thank you. Welcome. Sorry, do you want to talk about any other trials or concepts or something that you're thinking about or, you know, where the field is going or 
um, something like that. And also, you know, any other new research? Oh, I had a question. So there, there have been like one or two studies recently where people have combined um, immunotherapy along with um, long course radiation, right? Or I think, yeah, a couple of times. And then they have seen like very good um, um, pa um, pathology complete response. So I was kind of wondering, I mean, um, you know, and we are always looking for ways to increase the CCR. And so is that like something that your center is interested in doing? Yeah, I think it is. I think once we complete the NAMERA study, that's kind of the next points on our docket. I think there are um, you know, the immunobiologists will say, at least I think they would say, that hypofractionating the radiation would potentially be better than long course chemo radiation because the school of thought is if you're giving radiation every day when the immune cells are trying to come in and clear up things, you're killing the immune cells while they're there, which are very radiosensitive. So if you can finish the radiation in five days and then let the immune cells come in and do their job with the immune therapy, you may have an even better immune response. And so we're very excited to test immune therapy with short course radiation. Thank you. And then uh, any other future directions? I mean, we had um, Dr. Krishan Jetwa come and talk to us about proton therapy. I mean, any or other tracers or what is new in radiation therapy that you want to tell us? Yeah, I think that some future directions, you know, adaptive radiation therapy is a very, very um, hot topic right now. And so can you adapt a new plan every day to decrease bowel toxicity or maybe just escalate dose to the primary tumor or the lymph nodes? I think that's a potential topic. I think immune therapy, like you discussed, but we really need um, kind of the elephant in the room is, is there ever gonna be a trial that compares um, long course chemo RT and short course radiation for non-operative management, right? We're extrapolating based off of the Rapido study which involves surgical resection, right? And then we have our multi-institution phase um, two data coming out, but I don't know if we're ever gonna get there because it's a very, very um, difficult thing to have these two comparative arms. I think, you know, on Twitter recently, somebody was asking, are we ever gonna have a, a, a study where we do short course non op versus surgery. And I, I don't think that would happen either because I don't think patients would go for that, right? You, you kind of have in your mind what, what, what you want if you have a clinical complete response before you're randomized to a trial. And so um, these are very difficult um, trial questions. And so we appreciate your patience and advocacy as we, um, as we work with you to try to figure these out. But um, those are some, some of the limitations on how, how we're trying to practice right now. The data aren't available and those are the reasons why. Like um, I was seeing a paper today, I think, um, at least I saw it on Twitter today. So they were looking at some, um, I, I it was kind of over my head, to be honest, but they were looking at some genomic signatures and trying to figure out, um, you know, if you can guess like what kind of signatures would predict uh, radio sensitivity. And they were looking at a bunch of tumors, but they did not have color. I mean, I think I tagged you on the thing, on the tweet. Oh, okay. Uh, I, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a once a day tweeter. So I sometimes every other day, I need to be more active on Twitter. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at that later. Yeah, there's been a lot of radiomics data and um, especially um, from Moffitt, um, one, of, one of the radiation oncologists out there is very um, prolific in publishing in that domain. Um, but I'll, I'll take a look at that paper later. Yeah, I, I think this is a study from Moffitt. So they also, oh. on La Lancet, they had the video abstract. So um, I think, um, and then, one of the authors have, had also provided provided a tutorial, but you know, like uh, it was a little bit above my head. It was more about like dosing and sensitivity and things like that. Yeah, so. yeah. no, the, this this physician that publishes uh, his name is kissing me right now. Um, um, but yeah, he he's very 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 bright, and his his papers go above my head um, very easily. So yeah, the the radiomics and all the the modeling to predict these is a very complex thing. But um, I'm glad that somebody's looking into that. Yeah, yeah. I think if um, nobody else has questions, then um, we can wind it up. Okay, right. thank you so much. And um, we have um, what we we have a um, site called Colentown University. It's publicly, you know, it's open to the public. So this video will go over there. And we have a section on rectal cancer. So if you want to send your patients um, so that they can watch the video at their convenience, you know, that'd be great. Okay, thank you so much for your time. No problem. Take care. You too. Thanks. Bye.